Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Horasis panel at our annual Global India meeting. Uh, this morning, it's uh, my great privilege to introduce to you uh, two very interesting panelists who will be addressing uh, our question for today, uh, testing the strength of Indian democracy. Uh, I'm Lou Marinoff, professor of philosophy at the City College of New York and a veteran of many Horasis meetings, including all the India meetings, at which I have met some incredible people and learned a great deal. And I hope to continue that experience today. Allow me to introduce our distinguished panelists to you. Uh, Sanjay Abaru, former advisor and spokesperson of uh, Prime Minister Singh, and uh, Makarand uh, Faranjape, a professor and director of the India Institute for Advanced Study. So, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, welcome also to our audience. Uh, I see some familiar faces already in the room, uh, and I will certainly uh, invite uh, comments uh, after we uh, hear from you on the main questions and their implications. Uh, we'll have uh, time uh, to open the room for further questions and discussions from our uh, audience. All right, so uh, without further ado then, let, let me ask you uh, the first uh, of a series of questions. Uh, it, it seems to be implicit that democracy has inherent strengths. So certainly, uh, it's uh, an experimental form of government in the sense that uh, there's no guarantee as to which direction it will take and to which outcome it will attain. Uh, nonetheless, uh, democracy has been very strong in the last uh, century or so. India is, is the largest, one of the newest democracies in the world. Uh, I would like to ask you, first and foremost, what sorts of strengths uh, do you perceive in the main uh, in Indian democracy and how in a general way are they are they being tested? And then we'll turn to more specific areas. All right, I'll, I'll start with you, Sanjaya. What are the main strengths of Indian democracy and what are the main tests that, that they face? Please. Well, I mean, the, the main strength of Indian democracy is that it's the inheritance of our national movement. I think the foundation on which it has been built, uh, the fact that we have a written constitution that came out of the national movement, uh, the constituent assembly was an elected assembly. So when the Indian constitution says, we the people, uh, it actually refers uh, to the, uh, it's an authentic statement that the constituent assembly uh, was not just a group of intellectuals, uh, but was in fact a representative uh, you know, a gathering of elected persons uh, who in their wisdom uh, and almost all of them were participants in the national movement for independence. So given that uh, experience, the inheritance of the national movement, they gave us this constitution, having read the best constitutions in the world. So I think the most important strength of Indian democracy is its written constitution. And, you know, one needs to actually remind ourselves about this because the constitution has been challenged uh, repeatedly. It has been amended any number of times. Uh, so given the fact that in practice, uh, the constitution that we now have is not actually the constitution that we began with, uh, is both a testament to its uh, resilience as well as a comment on, uh, you know, on, on, on uh, how... Um, it has been able to deal with the challenges uh, of the time. So I would say that is the first important strength of Indian democracy. Well, thank you very much. And uh, before I, I come to Makara, you have a quickly, very quickly a second one because that's equally important is the fact that it is today democracy has become a way of life. Uh, I think the, you know the, the reality of India uh, is that most of us have come to accept. The, the institutions of democracy as a way of life. I think these are the two main strengths of our democracy. Very interesting. Uh, thank you very much, Sanjay. So, I mean, uh, to the second point, yes, I mean, people tend, when they're born, to, to accept uh, the received conditions into which they emerge. So uh, you're, you're saying democracy is now a, a natural thing uh, for Indians, uh, and so it will not be challenged uh, uh, on the basis of it seeming to be uh, the way things ought to be. But your first point is interesting, and before I call on uh, Macarand, I would like to return to you on one issue, please. Uh, constitutions are, are extremely important uh, documents in the foundations of 
uh, democracies. And yet, unlike uh, books of logic and mathematics, they're not self-interpreting. Uh, so then there could be further uh, political strife that emerges from perhaps conflicting interpretations of, co of, a, of a constitution or indeed in struggles to ascertain uh, the meaning and relevance of particular parts of a constitution to contemporary life. So has that become an issue in India? Are there indeed conflicts over what the constitution is supposed to say and accomplish? Yes, I mean, time and again, I mean, for the very fact that we have so many amendments to the Constitution uh, is itself evidence of the fact that uh, the parliament, the elected parliament from time to time has felt it necessary to make changes to the Constitution. But I think there have also been moments when the basic principles of the Constitution have been challenged or have been altered. I mean, Indira Gandhi amended the Constitution during the emergency uh, to declare India not just a sovereign democratic uh, republic, but a sovereign, secular, socialist, democratic republic. And the current dispensation in, in Delhi, um, uh, you know, um, of course, they continue to use the word socialist to describe their economic policies, which I think any any political party in India wants to pretend it's socialist, but are challenging the word secular um, and the and, uh, way in which it has been interpreted. So, the, you know, even the basic principles have been challenged in the past and continue to be challenged. But I think there I would add just one more idea, which is that the Indian Supreme Court uh, has actually in the past played a very um, you know, wise role uh, in defending the basic principles of the Constitution. Uh, whether the Supreme Court will continue to do so in future is a big question mark. Uh, given the general <laughs> trends in the Indian judiciary and quality of, of, of the composition of the judiciary. Uh, but till now, at least, the judiciary has upheld uh, most of the principles of the Constitution. Yes, well, that's very important. I mean, we have a parallel, as you know, parallel situation in the U.S., where the judiciary is one of the main branches, and we depend and we rely on the uh, independence of the judiciary as far as it goes in order to uphold our constitution, as do you. Uh, Macarand, I want to turn to you with really the same question to start. I know Claude Begley is in the room and has asked for the mic already, and I can hardly wait to hear from him. But, Claude, please bear with us uh, while we while we at least give our, our main speakers a chance to air their views, and then I'll very happily turn to you and give you the mic. All right. So, Macarand, could, could I ask you the same question, please? What are the inherent strengths uh, as you see them of Indian democracy and how are they being tested currently? Uh, indeed, I think uh, uh, Indian democracy is an extraordinary phenomenon. In 2019 elections, there were more than 900 million eligible voters. I would think about 915 million or 912 million, uh, which is thrice the population of the United States. And we had had a 67% turnout. In 2014, there were about 834 million registered voters. In addition to what Sanjay said, we have a very robust uh, election commission. And uh, the elections in India are generally perceived to be free and fair, except in one or two very rare instances where there is booth capturing or some malpractice. And when that is established, uh, elections in those areas are countermanded and there is a repolling. So I think there is something somewhat sacred about Indian democracy. And uh, I don't think it's in danger. Uh, there are constitutional safeguards. Uh, Sandra mentioned the Supreme Court. But overall, I, I have this feeling that, uh, you know, Indian democracy is a, is a festival of freedom for Indians. It's a carnival. It's the biggest show on earth. So I think it's very robust in terms of how we uh, turn in elected representatives to rule us. But what are the testing times you mentioned? What are the threats? I think, paradoxically, the biggest threat to Indian democracy is politics. I said this is a paradox because democracy relies on politics. It is a political system. And in India, people are proud of saying, oh, we had democracy many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, we had village republics. But the fact is that parliamentary democracy with political parties is a new thing for us. 
you know political parties in india began in the 1880s 1885 1886 with the indian national congress which was not even a political party so uh, you know the point is that india india has many states it's got a federal structure and uh, there are many different parties which rule in many different states and by and large we get along this is a great thing but when i said politics is a threat to democracy what i mean is that while we can uh, be reasonably happy that the electoral process is running well in civil society unfortunately party politics is infected every area of human life from how you dress to what you eat you know to what movie you th- uh, you see about opinions you hold that's perfectly all right what books you read but what i'm trying to say is that democracy implies a freedom of speech which is a constitutional right it apply it it implies dialogue dissent but today we witness an unprecedented polarization you know i've grown up in this country and i've never seen india uh, and indians as politicized i mean it's like every area of our life has been invaded by this uh, virus of uh, party politics polarization so that the that uh, in a sense our uh, the, the practice of our freedom uh, freedoms you know that practice has been curtailed i believe so whether it's the press or whether it's how political parties target opponents there are charges such as sedition laws going back to british india can you imagine which are being uh, almost uh, you know indiscriminately used uh, and uh, institutions of democracy you know uh, including uh, some of our investigative agencies the tax department these may be used against political opponents mm-hmm. now you may say this part par for the course every every party has done it every government has done it but i think this weakens this weakens our democracy and finally what i wanted to say is that i think sanjay was right he mentioned uh, very apex institutions you know uh, the supreme court you know the electric uh, the you know election commission the comptroller and auditor general of india and so on and so forth the judiciary but there are a myriad other institutions which are required for us uh, to be free in the true sense of the word these include you know our colleges and universities many of which are state funded and uh, uh, you know there's the press uh, which is the fourth f- pillar of democracy uh, the radio the television and hundreds of other institutions and institutional practices uh, both government semi government and some belonging to the civil society like ngos and i believe that what i mentioned earlier this so called uh, you know malaise or miasma of politics has now infected all these institutions and uh, it seems to weaken them and i think a democracy is only as good as its institutions and if we don't do more to safeguard these institutions and their independence then i'm afraid that uh, even if we are largely democratic in the electoral sense of it, of, of the word but in our daily life and uh, practice uh, our freedoms are being curtailed and finally what i want to also say i want to present the contra view that uh, you know if you look at just the media or the newspapers you get a different picture of india walk the streets walk the streets even during the second wave of corona i had to travel and uh, you know by and large uh, you know in the villages in the cities on the streets of india things are uh, quite free Uh, and uh, quite safe thank you all right thank you mark and well i would i would come back then uh, to uh, sanjay and ask if you uh, are in accord with or if you differ with macaron's view of this i mean one could distinguish surely between pol- politics and politicization uh, aristotle as you know uh, defined us as a political animal and and we are and we have been since we probably came out of the caves not before but you are pointing macaron to something more alarming and that is uh, this tendency to politicize we we have seen this in politicization and weaponization 
of branches of government uh, is something that has become excessive in the United States now. In my living memory, I've never seen it this bad. And it produces polarization such that, uh, and tell me if this is happening or likely to happen in India, uh, Sanjay. I mean, we have now families divided by politics. Uh, this is the first time in my living memory uh, I remember this supposedly happened uh, historically during our civil war when when the conflict cut right through the household. Uh, it was, uh, in my childhood, very common for husbands and wives to vote differently, for example. And it was never a problem. And one could sit at the family table and discuss politics, and one could have different voting patterns, and this did not dissolve the fabric. Now, however different uh, the polarization has produced a, a, basically a civil war such that it is a justification for the breakup of relationships one one cannot have a dialogue in some civil way with someone who has different political views owing not to politics macaran but to politicization uh, and and the polarization that produces sanjaya do you see this as a threat to indian democracy is macaran overstating this or do you agree with him no, no, there is a serious threat to Indian democracy. I mean, I don't think we can be, you know, um, um, too light, take it too lightly. Um, you know, I, in my initial remarks, I, since you asked the question, what are the strengths of Indian democracy? I refer to the strengths. But with time, we have accumulated weaknesses and, um, uh, you know, institutional weaknesses. Uh, the way in which we are treating certain uh, in a constitutional institutions, um, and 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 that is uh, you know increasingly a problem for us. But on the question that you specifically posed on politicization, yes, I mean just as you have a view in the United States that suggests that white Americans are somehow superior citizens as compared to Hispanics and blacks and other other uh, you know later immigrants. We now have an ideology in India that says Hindus are in some senses superior citizens and, and other religions, uh, you know, after all, they may today believe in uh, Islam or Christianity, but their ancestors were all Hindus. So everybody is a Hindu and this is a Hindu country. So, you know, you have this white, white America um, politics in the U.S., uh, which, which is what we saw during in, in Donald Trump. And we have the Hindu India politics uh, currently represented by Narendra Modi and his uh, version of, of politics. And these are serious issues which are dividing uh, families, as you correctly said, which are dividing communities. Because I think a lot of us are concerned about the stability of the system. I think the, uh, the problem both in the United States and India, and not just in the US and India, you look around democracies in Europe, for example, um, where this has become a big issue between, you know, ethnic solidarity of ethnic communities and then immigrants um, and immig uh, immigrants around the world uh, are under challenge. Um, so the, the, the kind of democracy that we are now seeing emerging is in fact a, what, what you can best describe as a majoritarian democracy or rather a majoritarian autocracy because the majority then is able to dictate to the minority. The, the way in which we understand democracy, uh, you know, in theory at least, is that even if the majority comes to power, uh, filling the, all the institutions of government, uh, they, they take care of the minorities. I mean, you hear all these speeches every time the U.S. president you know, uh, is sworn in uh, in January uh, after he's elected. He says, I am now president of all America. And we have our prime minister who says, Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas. That is your prime minister of the whole country. And yet your politics are politics of the majority. Um, and, and the policies are... The, and that is a challenge. It's a global challenge. Majoritarian authoritarianism is emerging as a global challenge. Uh, and, and, and I think... And, and one other you know, point I'd like to emphasize. You know, Andre Bethe, a very distinguished Indian sociologist, uh, once said India is not a democracy but a seafocracy. Uh, which means that, you know, you are a democracy on the day of the elections. Everybody has the right to vote. You go queue up and you vote. We have now a more 
sensible uh, system of voting than the United States, where you can uh, electronically you know, cast your vote and within a few days get the result. Uh, and don't have to go through the agonies of American counting and you know. <laughs> but yet, that's the day in which your power ends. Because then, the nature of representation is weak. And, and the, the relationship between the elected representative and, and, and the voter uh, is in may become only weaker uh, for a variety of reasons. And one doesn't have to go into those reasons now. So I think the challenges that Indian democracy, I mean, just as I, as I began by saying that there are great strengths of Indian democracy, the challenges we face are equally powerful challenges. Yes. And, so, so let me ask each of there are some wonderful questions coming in the chat room, and I'm going to read them aloud, ask you to respond. Just before doing so, just two more quick questions for each of you, please. So you, you've given a picture of the uh, perhaps the greatest challenge uh, domestically, uh, although please, uh, the, the United States is not that simple. We, we don't have your pluralism. We have a two-party gridlock. But uh, this, this out, these allegations of white supremacy are, are nonsense ginned up by, by, by people who seek to profit from them. How could a white supremacist country have elected Barack Obama twice for eight years? Just look at the evidence, all right? I mean, I don't want to discuss the states now, but please, let's balance reality against allegation. Uh, there, this is not a white supremacist country. Whites are increasingly in the minority in many areas. And what we're seeing is this horrible specter of racism in the United States being ginned up as a boogeyman in order for people to, in fact, uh, aggregate enormous power. That's a different topic and a different conversation. Let me ask you this, though. What about foreign affairs? Uh, what uh, challenges, in your view, uh, the greatest challenge, perhaps, uh, what is that uh, coming from uh, geopolitics? What does India have to contend with? I'll ask you first, Makaran. Uh, thank you, Lou. I just wanted to say one little thing to the earlier question. I think that uh, we shouldn't exaggerate the dangers to Indian democracy. The things that were pointed out, the institutional challenges, were there, were there from day one. And the other thing is that democracy is constantly shifting and the trend towards autocracy within democracies is worldwide. It's not an Indian problem merely. And as to majoritarianism uh, per se, I think that's also been trumped up unnecessarily. I don't think that is the issue. I think that uh, we need to create more bipartisan spaces in India. The polarization means that in the political sphere, imagine this, uh, the uh, the rest of uh, the political spectrum, it would seem, wants a Modi Mukt Bharat, that is, an India without Modi. Modi, no Modi, whatever else. And and the BJP, including uh, the Prime Minister Modi, saying we want a Congress Mukt, that is, a Congress-free Bharat. This is not how democracies work. We need space for all political parties and views, provided that the people support them. The earlier point is very important, though, that... Uh, Indian electorate uh, officials are not held to those levels of accountability as are often the benchmark in other parts of the world. This is absolutely true. Uh, and it's not because Indian voters are lazy, it's just that our systems are such. But also that smaller countries in Europe, you know, they vote on everything, whether you need a road in your neighborhood, whether there's a school. We We vote once in five years and then there's pretty much very little we do. The rest of the time, there's a lot of noise. Now, coming to foreign policy, I think it's very important that in India, there are people who have what I call China envy. They like to centralize power. They want efficiency. They think authoritarianism uh, will produce efficiency. The Chinese economy is five times that of India. These people think we can catapult uh, and reach the same league as China if only there's less dissent, there's less debate. And of course, I disagree. But talking about China, we are in a new geopolitical environment. The, uh, you know, time tested and uh, I would say possibly unsuccessful Indian non-alignment, I don't think is, uh, is viable in today's world. Uh, of course, it doesn't mean that we're going to join any particular group. But I see that there is a definite shift towards the United States. And there's a very important reason for it. The Indian diaspora is huge and uh, it's, it's broken through the glass ceiling in North America, particularly in the United States. 
and so the there's a new neighborhood you know it's not our neighbors in our borders who are mostly quite uh, unfriendly the bigger ones uh, but neighbors uh, you know contiguities through internet and other sources farther afield uh, which uh, which are going to shape our interests i think much more than they did before but i believe india has to play a balancing act there's an old ally uh, we were allies of russia in the old cold war we can't antagonize them completely we still import half our weapons from russia uh, earlier we were definitely definitely aligned to the uh, uh, the arab side we haven't uh, end of that but we are very close to israel now i don't believe ever before in our history we've been as close to israel as we are today yeah. and right. with with china we've had a very a difficult a few months i would say a few years even uh, with uh, uh, you know xi jinping just visited a, a village in arunachal which is right on our border on the border of arunachal pradesh because of tibet and so forth so this is going to be a difficult time for india uh to negotiate these differing uh, you know alignments and tensions but every crisis is an opportunity i think that uh, you know the corona virus uh, pre- pandemic presented us with one or two opportunities i believe we've lost a couple of them but uh, i think there's still a huge opportunity uh, with the distrust of china in the advanced uh, capitalist countries there is economic uh purchase economic uh, advantages uh for india uh, and uh, i think we are reaping some of those benefits already right. well thank you very much we'll return to the coronavirus as the last point before we open up to the floor but uh, sanjay are you in accord with makaran or would you like to elaborate on this notion of india's potential realignment uh, or whatever form the non alignment take please give us your view on this No I don't entirely agree with Makaran in fact I think we are now entering a very very uncertain phase as far as geopolitics and our international relations are concerned uh the fact is that from 1991 at the end of the cold war till about 5 years ago uh the world saw us as a rising economy as an economy that is opening up to the rest of the world there are a lot of opportunities in india and took a more benign view of india um and therefore we were able to manage relations with all the major powers we were able to remain friendly with the united states while retaining our friendship with russia and also trying to improve our relations with china we tried to be friends with the arabs and israel and with iran and with everybody else and that phase that comfort phase is over uh we are being forced to make choices uh and choices at a time when it's not very clear uh how reliable the kind of partnerships we make can be i mean you take the united states uh, which was an ally in the fight against uh, uh, jihadi uh, islamic terrorism uh, and today the united states has walked out of afghanistan handed it over to taliban uh, what does it mean for india yeah, it's not very clear uh and, and you know, has, has the united states um you know left us at, at a very difficult uh, point Uh, in in our own uh, regional security situation then you take china i mean the fact is that you know, i just heard henry kissinger yesterday giving an interview to the economist magazine where he's, you know he's now is going on and on about how it's necessary for the united states and china to kind of come to uh, accept each other and live together you know, to, to how long can we depend on the us uh, in dealing with our neighbor who is a problem country uh we so if tomorrow the us and china come together like uh, bigner brzezinski suggested long back uh, you know the g2 uh, and run the world um as two members of the un security council of which we are still not permanent members so there are a lot of uncertainties and all these uncertainties are emerging at a time when our economy is not doing well we well, are slowed we are slowed you know, there is a reassessment of our economic uh, prospects So my own view is that India is now uh, after a long time of comfort entering a period of uncertainty uh, and uh, we do not have too many aces of our uh, hand uh, to deal with this uncertainty unless the indian economy bounces back and we return to 8% growth and you know there's much greater steam at home 
uh, which will allow us to you know spend more on defense and also uh, open up our economy more we have actually been closing our economy in many ways in the last three, four five years so i think geopolitics are, are a very challenging terrain as far as india is concerned indeed indeed they are but i mean i can't help react to your comment about the us and china collaborating to run the world the us cannot run itself at this point in the last 6 months uh we we've seen catastrophe after catastrophe so don't get me started but i hope that india would actually help as the world's largest democracy to show the way to overcome some of these challenges that we all face on planet earth covid being the overarching one at the moment so let me then finally before turning to the chat room ask you uh to what extent uh, covid has exacerbated these problems to what extent is covid uh, mandated a more of a pulling together of society to work uh you know more uniformly toward a resolution so there's been plus and minus it's obviously impacted your economy do you see this uh, uh as something that will take time to recover from so very quickly macaron could you just encapsulate your thoughts about covid uh, how has this affected indian democracy uh yes i think that uh, to go back just for a moment we've moved from uh, unipolarity to multipolarity and multipolarity to heteropolarity i agree with sanjaya it's a very uncertain time but i think i was responding to the point about the possibilities of newer alignments and corona is showing us that uh, i think that the medicalization of society uh, you know has been as it were taken to new heights by corona but the pandemic and it's really important for leaders all over the world to turn their attention to simpler prophylaxis i mean to building immunity better lifestyles smaller carbon footprints and so forth instead i think you know we started off the first wave in india saying we'll be the world's pharmacy and then you know we had to eat our words so to speak we didn't have enough for ourselves and uh, the pandemic uh, exposed the very uh, deep problems in our medical infrastructure and in all infrastructure in general you know oxygen supply india is one of the largest producers of oxygen of industrial oxygen but we were simply not able to manage that in such a manner that we could save lives and yet in parliament we are told that there are no deaths because of oxygen shortage so there's a lot of stuff going on but but here's the deal the point that i think corona is forcing us to acknowledge is that uh we need different ways in which we can collaborate with one another and the nation state system the competitive economics of uh, the older phase of globalization and even the shrill uh, politics uh, evangelical politics of uh, climate change those are not going to be the models we need a new kind of wisdom and the new networking across the world uh, across blocks and across competing uh, alliances quad versus something else uh, we need uh, civil society initiatives at a global level uh, to open up conversations and spaces for change and i think indian entrepreneurship we've had a huge zomato um you know ipo which is sort of uh, created history you know of a company which has not earned in 1 dollar of profit it is suddenly one, worth more than 100000 crores you know uh, i mean the market capitalization has put it in the top few brackets and what does it do it delivers food it uh, it's an app which tells you what you'll got get to eat you can order online and so forth so yeah. so i think there's a churn i think there is scope for indian entrepreneurship at various levels but i also think this is the time to push through reforms 30 year reforms in india we're celebrating we need much more deregulation we need to open up uh, the creative energies of our people in all respects including the farm sector where we've got an ongoing agitation and i think that overall uh, again i mean these are very tough times for india but i i feel optimistic that we are going to rise to the challenge all right i know you're an optimist you always seem to be optimistic and uh, that's a good thing sanjay how how do you feel about about the corona threat is it something that you will transcend uh, or is it something that is going to take time for india to get over 
No, as far as Corona as a public health challenge is concerned, we have, I think, handled it much better than the United States or Europe. Uh, given the fact that our resources are fewer, our access to the vaccine has been more limited. But I think public response to the ma- management of Corona in this country has been exemplary. But what it has done really is that it has worsened the economic slowdown. As I said, the economy is already slowing down. And the impact of the lockdown and, and the pandemic has been to further slow down invest, uh, the rate of growth of the economy, to further uh, you know, harm the investment uh, in the overall economy. I mean, what is happening in startups, etc., does is not creating employment. Poverty rates have gone up. Unemployment has gone up. So there is a negative impact of the pandemic and the, the lockdown uh, on the economy. And that certainly worries me uh, because we need to ha- return to high rates of economic growth that reduce poverty, that create jobs. And that is not happening. Uh, that is not yet happening. Mm. Uh, but the great thing, of course, is that people have been able to respond uh, to the demands being placed on them. I mean, really little children, you know, for fifth, half, more than half the year, children have been at home, not going to school. Families are dealing with all of those pressures. You know, a lot of people have lost employment. Families are dealing with those pressures. And the fact that you have a society in which those pressures are being absorbed uh, and not yet destabilizing the the society, I think that's a great achievement, but it's a social achievement. Uh, As far as government policy is concerned, I don't see the economy really picking up given the kind of half-hearted measures being taken uh, to revive demand, to revive employment. Uh, I think, you know... We are, we are in a serious uh, economic situation. All right. Well, thank you very much for tempering Macaron's optimism. And uh, we'll, we'll have to see which of you turns out to be more correct. And we don't know. I want to turn quickly to some of the questions in the chat room. Now, I'm going to challenge each of you to shoot from the hip and give a one-minute answer. All right? I want you just to to give a very quick, uh, short, sharp answer so we can get through. There are some really interesting points being raised. The first one from Claude Begley, how to combine partisan activities and the need to build a strong consensus in a time of crisis like COVID. So how do we get to partisan activities uh, and combine them in order to build consensus? Very quickly, Makarand, any thoughts? Through dialogue, through more and more dialogue. And this has to happen at all levels, whether on platforms such as ours, or in institutions across the country, universities, colleges, and other kinds of town hall type of things. And uh, I hope some of this picks up. And also social media, which, despite all its problems, is a very lively place for the exchange of opinions. All right, that's good. Dialogue, where it's not shut down. I mean, dialogue implies two. Uh, not not monologue, but dialogue, and that also entails freedom to voice and to air one's views, though they be unpopular in certain segments. I mean, I support that. Easier said than done in an era when uh, technocracy seems to be reigning uh, and uh, shaping public opinion. Uh, Sanjaya, what do you think about that? Is it possible to combine partisan activities through dialogue, as Makaran suggests? Not through dialogue, but politics of consensus building. We have been fortunate since 1991 till 2014. We had three prime ministers, Narasimha Rao, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, and Manmohan Singh, who are all consensual leaders who took the opposition with them. They, all of them ran coalition governments. Narasimha Rao ran a minority government and yet brought about the most drastic economic reform you know, 30 years ago uh, because the leadership was consensual. Today, we have a highly you know, partisan leadership that is not reaching out to the other side. And that is what has to change. All right, thank you. Now, a very contentious question and a great question raised by Srikanth, and I'm very glad that he did it. So uh, we have to ask, and this could easily be the topic, of course, for another panel, and I hope it will be. But again, I'm going to ask you for one minute answers to this. One of the weaknesses, Srikanth says, as the consulting lead of the Digital Economist, is actually freedom of expression and freedom of speech to the extent that intolerant speech and destructive speech is given the same privilege as, let us say, uh, difference of opinion. So uh, is freedom of speech absolute? Should it be? 
absolute, even when uh, freedoms could perhaps be utilized to destroy the foundations of the actual system which tolerates freedom. In other words, can we tolerate intolerance and embody that as freedom of speech? Are you asking me? Yes, I'll start with you, I, Sanjay. Well, I, 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 I've been half my professional life a, a journalist, a writer. I defend freedom of speech uh, to the last breath. Uh, we have a constitution that guarantees freedom of speech with provisos. Our constitution, in fact, was amended even at the very beginning uh, to allow for certain kinds of uh, you know, situations. Um, and therefore, I don't think we need to worry about the law of the land. It, it allows for dissent. But at the same time, it does not allow uh, for freedom of speech that would be divisive, that would provoke, uh, you know, violence, or uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, but on the, having said all of that, I am 100% for freedom of speech. Societies have a way of correcting themselves. Democracies of the world have been more resilient than autocratic systems. And therefore, you know, even intolerant speech will be limited when more and more people are allowed to speak sense. So, if more and more people are allowed to speak sense. Uh, I mean, uh, that, that's a, a big caveat. Makaran, your, your, your sharp answer to this question, yeah, please. I, are I, there limits? I, what are they? I go with Karl Popper. I think there are limits, but uh, I think that these limits should not be misused to target opponents. We have to be very careful about those who detest open societies and will, you know, invade these societies with the view to bring them down. We have to distinguish between these people and other people who disagree with us. And I completely agree with, uh, with consensus building. I mentioned that earlier. We need more bipartisanship. But I also want to talk about another thing, Lou, as a philosopher. Uh, you know, the ethics of listening. We are not paying attention. You know, we need to attend one another in the shrill and raucous debates which characterize today's exchanges. Nobody's interested in listening to the other. I think we have to return to a quieter space where at least among so-called intellectuals, you know, we have to lend our ear, you know, to our friends and foes, so to speak, uh, you know, FOE, freedom of expression, you know, and, and, and listen. I think we need the ethics of listening. Yes, well, this is going to be changed completely by emergent technologies, I'm afraid. It's no longer possible, really, to have a debate in the, in the arcane sense of different views being presented and moderated. Even our presidential debates did not achieve this at all, as they once did, I believe. Uh, so what people tend to do is watch the YouTube presentations which vindicate and reinforce their particular points of view and this just exacerbates polarization it does not bring people together into fruitful dialogue uh, i'm afraid it just uh, it just increases the gaps in, and and our inability that's a more pessimistic view last question for you then overall uh, i think you've already answered this but give us your one minute takeaway we only have two minutes left are you, therefore, still sanguine about India's emergent democracy and its potential to set an example for the world, given the enormity of the population and the high degree of participatoriness? Are you an optimist at the end of the day uh, that India will overcome these difficulties and continue to be a great spiritual lamp in addition to other things? Uh, uh, Sanjay, are you first, please? Well, I am an optimist, mainly because we have seen lots of challenges and we have overcome these challenges. We are a poor country. We are a low-income uh, developing economy. We have to recognize the challenges that we have. And I think by and large we do. Uh, those who in, have you know, exaggerated expectations from India will be disappointed. But I don't have exaggerated expectations. I know what our challenges are. I know what our constraints are. And given those constraints, given those challenges, we have done reasonably well. I think we have demonstrated to the rest of the world and even the United States in the past that we are a tradition of respecting pluralism. It's only in the recent past that this has been challenged uh, with, as I said, uh, this kind of dominance of uh, Hindu majoritarianism. Otherwise, by and large, we, we have respected uh, minorities uh, and our democracy respects plurality. Uh, we are a multilingual, multi-ethnic uh, you know, society. So therefore, I think we are reasonably 
uh, optimistic. Thank you very much. Uh, Makaran, do you concur with this? Oh, I would go farther. I think we are on the cusp of a huge upsurge. I would call it the Indian Renaissance, and it's going to contribute to a global renaissance. And India will go on, but despite all its problems and its democracies and pluralistic society are very robust. And more than any of these, India is a metaphysic. It's a way of regarding ourselves and the world, and it's a way of self-transformation. And these things, in my view, uh, will never be diluted, regardless of the other issues that plague us, which we must deal with. Uh, but I think India will be a shining beacon to the rest of the world, especially when it comes to freedom, pluralism, openness, acceptance of a variety of religious as well as political views, and the fundamental urge to live and let live. Thank you. Gentlemen, we have uh, elapsed our time. I want to thank you very much for sharing your views with us. Um, they've been very interesting to hear. Uh, there have been too many comments to respond to, but that's a good sign. Uh, I hope the debate will continue. I hope the pluralism continues. I hope India's democracy continues and that you don't become politicized and secularized to the extent that you lose your very much admired spirituality as a nation. So thank you so much again. And uh, I look forward to meeting you in person, hopefully in the not too distant future. And thank those who participated and commented so interestingly. A good day to you all. And until we meet again, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Thank, thank you, Lou. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much.